Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and today we're jumping into some Tales from Tech Support. Today we have an epic 5 part series from Law Techie, the same person that brought us the story, where are we going and why are we in this handbasket, that I covered 3 years ago and you guys seem to like quite a bit cause it has 110,000 views. This story is called Back on the Help Desk, let's jump right into part 1. I just got hired by another staffing agency calling itself a consulting firm, got hired on a Friday, expected to be on site a few hundred miles away by Monday, despite first interviewing with them a month ago. I like a company with a long hiring practice and a short deadline. I sing the rest of the cake song as I ride my motorcycle to the client site. Long trips on a motorcycle lend to singing. Thankfully, nobody else can hear me. I've got a few more hours before I get to my hotel. This trip will be two days for introductions and whiteboarding. Then home to work remotely for the rest of the engagement. I'm doing the security thing as a part of a bigger multi-consulting firm project which resembles a city park pigeon feeding frenzy, a bunch of rotund, grey creatures loudly squabbling over a scattering of sustenance in bleak surroundings. I'm not too proud to grab some stale bread crust for myself though. Tonight's destination is a scabby Hampton Inn, I'll be here two days I tell myself. I bathe and fall asleep skipping dinner. The next morning I throw on a suit, hit a convenient waffle house, then ride carefully to the big corp regional offices in a nicely landscaped office park. Looking at the other company names on the signage, all I see are no name startups and those odd public private organizations trying to get a tech company to build in their rust belt valley. This office park was brought to you by Richard Florida quoting cargo cultists and third generation back slapping poles. So it's half graft and half hipster chic. It has both an unused ultimate frisbee field and designated motorcycle parking. Up front too, I feel seen. I back my bike into one of the spots. As I get off the bike, I do a little dance to celebrate parking like a king. My ride parks safe in one of the 8 spots. A celeste green Vespa and a handsomely weathered BMW slash 7 share the area. I make my way in the long sprawling office building, it's a bunch of enclosed offices off a central wide atrium hallway. Arched glass roof and exposed painted metal frameworks places this building in the mid 1990s an attempt to make an office park look like a hip mall from the 80s. I check in with the receptionist and get to hang out in the waiting room lobby. I'm now in the functional grey fabric cube maze, familiar territory for a consultant. A few minutes in and Squirrel shows up. Squirrel has a government name, I'm sure, but I can only remember him as Squirrel. He chatters away and has that odd freeze and stare reflex from time to time. Squirrel's both apologizing to me for something and relaying his position in the IT hierarchy here at Grey Goo. He radiates enough insecurity to make me squint. Despite Grey Goo's generic webpage, they're the middlemen you've never heard of in a few industries. For complicated reasons, a significant amount of sensitive data flows through them. Outside of the occasional NPR pledge drive shoutout, you'd never know their name. But they know you, someone you trust, trust them. Grey Goo's trying to do a bunch of things at the same time, migrate to the cloud, launch a few new products and fix a few security problems. Each of these is being run by a different consulting firm. These can either be showcases of professionalism or passive aggressive spatula fights. I don't care, it's all billable. Squirrel stops and points at a chair in a bullpen, mostly full of younger, more casually dressed people with headsets. We're running low on space, so I'm putting you here with the help desk. I have just enough time to stow my gear, work the coffee machine and find a chair in a largish conference table. Wishful thinking and lies by omission are relayed to us via PowerPoint decks for 3 hours. I have learned that I'm on 2 tasks. One. I'll be managing our teams of pen testers in their attempts to poke holes in Grey Goose defenses. Two, there's a project to assess physical security at their satellite offices. I walk back to my bullpen digs, a handful of headset wearing folks lean back and take stock of the middle aged suit wearing douchebag. 
Hey folks, it's been a while since I've worked help desk. Not a smile. This is going to be a tough audience. While checking through an hour's worth of administrativa, I hear the usual patter of a help desk. No, not your personal password to Gmail, the one we gave you. Local sports team is a disappointment as usual. No, you can't edit that email you just sent outside the company. I'm gonna quit this crap once my crypto recovers. Printers do that. My email dings. Seems I'm being invited to a meeting where I get to defend a penetration test report. I gather from the people invited and the agenda. Some program manager isn't happy with some findings and wants to relitigate severity and scope. I guess I should read the report before I explain it. There are a few different ways to read a penetration test report. Non-technical people start at the beginning, lulled by the short, simple statements in the executive summary sandwiched between pretty graphs. IT operations and developers jump to the critical and high findings to see if they're going to be called on the carpet. This is cheating, like starting at Daltrey's scream in Won't Get Fooled Again. I start with the harder choices, the mediums. If the mediums are scarier than usual, the writers of the report wanted to downplay the findings. If they're not particularly awful, the writers just picked a few lows and promoted them to see fairer. These are some scary mediums, which tells me that Grey Goo doesn't actually like being told their baby is ugly. I take stock of my situation. I'm at a help desk at a client that would rather have me shut up and smile. This is going to be fun. To be continued. Back on the help desk, part two. I'm reading the pen test report I've got to defend in an hour or so. It's pretty well done. There are two high findings that will give me something to talk about. High, no separation between test and production environments. Details, testers were able to obtain production information from the provided test accounts. Specifically, the testers were able to find their own personally identifying information using only their access provided. High, authentication bypass. Details, testers were able to bypass authentication to the account initialization script and create their own test credentials. And to twist the knife, there's a devastating backslap hidden somewhere in the process improvement section where the testers point out that Grey Goo was so disorganized that they didn't actually give the testers credentials until the second week of the penetration test. These testers did their heaviest lifting coming in from the cold. Gnarly. If I were a more thorough consultant, I'd verify that I've got the necessary SharePoint access and whatever else I need while people are still around for the day. Because I'm a skilled consultant, I'm looking for a quiet place to participate in this call. Unfortunately, the help desk bullpen is too noisy for me to run a call. I catch the attention of a painfully thin woman wearing a headset. Hi there, I'm Law Techie. How do I reserve a conference room for a call? She points at her headset and shrugs her shoulders. You need a conference room for call? Invite it to the call in Outlook. Wonderful. All the conference rooms are named after big cities. I have no idea if Berlin is within walking distance or in another building. Normally, I'd take the call from the comfort of the rental car, but I thought I'd be clever to take the bike. I do remember a few benches out front of the building. It's a nice day. What the heck? I've got a commanding view of the parking lot from my picnic bench. Decent Wi-Fi. All I need to be really comfortable outside would be a plate of bitterballen or wings and a pint of beer. The call starts. According to the invite, about 10 people have been invited. I'm guessing a company as big as Grey Goo has the culture where managers and subject matter experts get defensively invited to meetings. We'll wait for them like tramps waiting for Godot for the first five minutes anyway. Cast of characters, Nigel, the product lead of some data management component of Grey Goo. He's got the English accent of someone who left the UK and never looked back, but realizes their accent makes them classy, even if they're from Leeds. He's unhappy that the pen test report isn't full of glowing praise. Quasi or Casey or something like that, they're calling from the bottom of the Fort McHenry tunnel or the loudest server room I've heard over the phone. I'm guessing by the noise, they're responsible for infrastructure. Kelly, she's a project manager trying to keep to a deadline long past. She's like a newscaster at a second tier SoCal TV station, 
cheerfully describing a bloody home invasion or school bus wreck. Sally, a penetration tester from one of the other consulting firms hoovering out cash from Grey Goo. If I remember correctly, she's listed as a junior on the pen test report. I'm guessing everyone more senior either moved on to greener pastures or just didn't care enough to show up. And some random 603 area code dial-in who hasn't introduced themselves. Once consensus is obtained that nobody more important, we get started. Nigel starts with an opening salvo. We've read the report, we have some concerns that these are issues in our test environment and not the customer facing environment. In that light, we'd like the high findings changed to information or at least low. I don't want to speak for Sally, but the ability of an attacker to start with no credentials at all and end up with elevated rights in production concerns me. But the issues were with the test environment. This guy is doing his best Oxford Don. I feel that I should have a handful of his robe in my hand to demand his attention next, like placing a stack of quarters on a bar pool table. Imagine you've got a warehouse where you store things of value. There's a customer entrance and an employee entrance. At both entrances, you have to be identified and determined if you're allowed to be there. At the customer entrance, they actually make sure that you're allowed in. At the employee entrance, they trust you when you say who you are and if you're allowed to be there. Once you're in, you're in the same building, despite what the sign over the door said. Nigel's thinking, Warble Garble Risk Committee, oh great, 603's GRC, Governance, Risk and Compliance. It hasn't gone to the Risk Committee yet, we need to finalize the report before we can refer it to them. Exactly, we've put a hold on remediation planning until we can get these findings downgraded to medium. Then we'll let you finalize the report. In the grand scheme, what's the difference between a high and a medium? You have a shorter time period to remediate highs, right? That's correct, 30 days versus 90 for a medium. I quickly look back to the cover page on the report. This test was completed almost seven months ago. So you've been fighting this impact rating longer than the remediation window for either, is that correct? We just don't believe these findings are worthy of the alarm that Sally's team raised because as you see it, the vulnerability was in a test environment, exactly. And because of this delay, you expect to remediate this around the time you're due for another pen test? I think we're starting a new one by the end of the year. We'd consider this out of scope. Fine, let's table this discussion for next week's call. Pleasantries are exchanged and I feel the need to just sit at this picnic table and breathe. I look up to notice a gleaming white SUV stopped in front of the motorcycle corrals. I watch as a man leans out of the driver's seat and views the six feet between my motorcycle and the old BMW bike. Satisfied with something, he gets back in his SUV and proceeds to pull his SUV into the space between the two bikes. Stupidity is afoot. I slam my laptop lid closed and jog over, waving and failing to get this guy's attention. While my Ducati and the Slash 7 are both European motorcycles, they're different. A BMW Slash 7 is a solid, well-engineered motorcycle for some serious motorcyclists. It's not fast or agile, but every angle is hefty and durable. I'd imagine when small town banks commissioned new branches in the 70s, they'd task architects to make their buildings look as solid as a Slash 7. My Ducati Scrambler is about as solid as a BMX bicycle. Ducati design fetishes lightweight and agility and in pursuit feel flimsy. A common joke is that the bolts and screws holding them together are actually made out of dried parmesan. However, one part on both bikes is deliberately made heavy and solid. To reduce vibration, motorcycle handlebars have solid steel weights at the end. The bar end weight is probably the least meringue-like part of the whole machine. An SUV guy just scraped a few feet of his Range Rover's front fender and driver's side door down my bar end weight. I don't think he'll be able to open the door without knocking over my bike. I notice the man is wearing ear pods and is engrossed in conversation. He rolls down the window and mutters something at me. I think I recognize the voice. Nigel? To be continued. Back on the help desk, part three. I'm doing security consulting again and a twit has decided to rub his shiny SUV 
up against my not so shiny motorcycle. I learned the following. 1. That wasn't Nigel. 2. I'm not as funny as I'd like when I'm angry. Not Nigel yells at me while I try to drag my bike off the side of his SUV. Insults get exchanged. Not Nigel roars off and disappears from view. I stomp my way back to the help desk pit and throw myself in my chair. I close my eyes and try to zone out for a minute. I'm interrupted by someone trying to get my attention without actually asking for it. Peering over the bullpen walls is a young man clearly irritated by my idleness. Yes? I've called you people multiple times about this. I still can't print. I look around to make sure he's not addressing someone behind me. Everyone else in this bullpen is busy. I'm about to make an excuse, then shrug my shoulders. What the heck? Sure thing. Take me to your PC and we'll see what's going on. Irritated man walks me through the office building. Cubicle walls change from gray to dusty rose and back again on the way. Irritated man shows me a printer queue with a handful of documents, all failing to print. A bit of poking reveals that he's trying to print to his printer at home. He's angry about this and initially refuses to believe that this was the problem and insists that I print PDFs, docs, and PPT files to prove that the printer works. I even show him how to select his home printer when he's, you know, home. He's much less irritated now. I make my way back to the help desk bullpen and try to get back to my actual work. One of the other denizens of the bullpen makes eye contact with me. He's a skinny young man wearing a corporate golf shirt. He introduces himself as Mark. Hi, I wanted to interface with you before the day ended. I can't tell if Mark is trying to talk to me or have s with me, getting me to install an RJ45 in my brainstem. I'm about to pay more attention to Mark, but my phone rings. It's Howard, the recruiter who got me this job. This is likely important. I put a hand up to motion to Mark that I need to take this call. Hi Howard, how's it going? Hey LT, I don't know how to say this, but what happened between you and Charles? I don't think I know a Charles. You had some altercation in the parking lot with a VP, said a scary biker type threatened him. Oh no. I can hear the blood rush in my ears. Mark's still talking, oblivious to my phone conversation. I stand up and put my hand over my phone. Mark, I have to take this. I'll be back to talk to you in a bit. I walk out to find somewhere quiet to talk with Howard. I pick the arched glass block ceiling central hall on the ground floor of this building. This must have been cooler than hypercolor t-shirts and Z Cavaricis when it was built. The teal and lemon paint scheme is an effective supporting cast. Howard pipes up. So Charles said you insulted him. Well, that sounds like me. What should I be doing? Is there work you can do elsewhere, like in another state? Huh? I do have some site audits as part of this engagement. I'll set them up and go on the road. Excellent. I knew you'd have a solution. You'll need to submit tickets to get time with the teams at the branch offices. Go through the travel agency for plane tickets and hotels. Mind if I drive rather than flying? I don't care, as long as the work gets done. Great. Let the client know that I'll be out of range of Charles in 20 minutes. Awesome. By the way, did you call Charles a no empire having jackbutt? That sounds like me. Scary biker type really doesn't. Howard laughs and hangs up. I walk back and start gathering my stuff. Mark's there, still eager to interface. Hey Mark, I need access to our ticketing system. Who do I ask? I'll take care of it and enroll you in everything you need. Thanks so much, Mark. Great meeting you. For some reason, Mark seems shocked at my packing up and running out the door to prevent any potential Charles issues. I throw on my jacket, helmet, and ride to a local coffee shop to send tickets for my site visits. Despite an eventful day, I'm looking forward to riding home. I have a feeling I'm missing something obvious, but I can't figure out what it is. Back on the help desk, part four, Pittsburgh. I've got a bunch of tickets sent to the appropriate parties to set up site visits for the following weeks. I decide to ignore the flurry of onboarding emails welcoming me to Big Corp since they're intended for real employees rather than a short-term mercenary like myself. I know I'm not going to enroll in healthcare, sign up for training, or attend Carrie's 10-year anniversary. Luckily, two sites respond quickly. There's a data center near Pittsburgh, PA, and a call center in Knoxville, Tennessee, 
that would love to have me the following week. This is perfect. I've got something billable to do, it's warm out, and I'm getting paid to ride my motorcycle. For some oddball reason, I'm seeing tickets unrelated to the site visits. I ignore them, figuring I've been put on a bunch of unnecessary distribution lists. I pack up my stuff and ride home, then decide to ignore work on the weekend. Sunday night, I ride out to a suburb of Pittsburgh, PA, and re-enter the consultant's world of mid-market hotels, restaurants filled with plasticky decor serving plasticky food. I entertain myself by reading the spotty and inconsistent documentation on this data center. My review should be simple. I'm curious how resistant this data center is to the usual insults, break-ins, backhoes, and natural disasters. I'd like to know what happens to Big Corp if something were to knock it offline or remove it from existence entirely. I've got incredibly detailed physical documentation. I could probably rock up to the counter at a gray bar or granger, hand the clerk the docs and a big check, and rebuild the interior of the data center. The system's documentation is spottier. I have an inventory of system names, but no clue of what they do, applications they run, let alone what business functions they support. So I'm going to have to ask a bunch of basic questions for the operations staff, which is going to be painful for all involved. I resist the desire to close out the bar at the chain restaurant that's walking distance from my hotel. Next morning, I make my way to the data center. I'm greeted at the door by Clyde. Clyde's one intense dude. He stands at parade rest while I show my credentials to the security guard, then takes me to a small conference room. He takes up a position by the door while I sit down and start pulling stuff out of my bag. The rest of the team will assemble here by 9.30. If you leave this room, I will escort you. Do you require anything? I'm glad that he reminded me that I can leave this room. The law school student part of my brain wants to yell, Am I being detained? Eventually, the rest of the team assembles and takes seats across from me. Clara, a middle-aged woman, conservatively dressed, but with a clear love of exciting eyewear. She's the IT operations lead. Raymond, a heavyset man with a clear love of caloric foods and short sleeve shirts. He's got an ill-developed goatee. He's the compliance liaison, a role I'd be curious to learn more about, but not enough to ask Raymond. He emits a steady stream of corporate word salad, like a junior high football coach vomiting out a successories catalog. Stephanie, a college intern, happy to not be stuck in a cube for half an hour. I decide to get things rolling. Hello, I'm Law Techie, and I've been sent by Enterprise Risk to better understand the operations here at this data center. I want to thank you all for your documentation and time. I do have some follow-up questions, which I hope you can help with. Raymond, leaning forward ominously, we've prepared a presentation. I used to believe that any presentation that started with a safety warning was going to be interesting. Used to. The presentation starts with the types of fire extinguishers and a requirement that steel-toed boots are required to be on the property. A few slides in after the history of the company and its importance in the industry, and I have to interrupt. I'm sure you all worked really hard on this, but I'm here for technical details. Might there be a slide about those? The quartet huddles for a minute, then looks back at me. You should have written your questions beforehand so we knew what to prepare for. I gave you all an agenda with the topics we discuss. We're just going to have a friendly conversation about what you all do here. If we hit questions you don't know the answers to, we can find other people to ask. Is that cool? Clara, looking over the top of her excitingly chunky eyewear, any questions you could possibly have are answered in the documentation we provided about that. I have a list of systems, but I don't know what they do or what applications they support. That's not in a document. Your Honor, permission to treat the witness as hostile. So how would I guess what CNLP 1431 does from its name? I have to ask somebody. And as far as I know, that someone is you. Do you want a current list of all the applications on that server? Sure, that and what its purpose is. She starts typing on her laptop for a few minutes, then turns it around to me. I see a screenshot of Task Manager. She's giving me what I ask for, not what I want. I've been at friendlier depositions. I close my eyes, push away from the table, and lean back. 
I need to keep my composure if I want to keep this gig. I breathe in and out, trying to calm myself. Alright, let's try this thought experiment. Imagine a large iron nickel asteroid comes in and smashes much of Allegheny County, vaporizing us and this data center. How would Big Corp's business be impacted? There's a silence, other than the sirrahs of the HVAC system and Raymond's open mouth breathing. I'm about to regret my open-ended question until I hear Stephanie's voice. I'm writing a report for credit. This data center hosts email, calendaring, and chat capabilities for Big Corp, along with another data center in San Jose, California. It also hosts development servers for Grey Goo, our new product offering. If this data center went down, Big Corp email would automatically switch over to the other data center. My soul re-enters my body with a snap. Is she correct? Well, that's a gross oversimplification. The data center has other process streams. Okay, such as? Which server are you referring to? Fine. Clara has chosen to do this the hard way. A few minutes of fiddling and I have my laptop connected to the projector. I put up the list of servers and we go line by line like an active directory eye exam. At the end of this, I'm hoarse, sweaty, and in possession of a very rough data flow diagram for Grey Goo's development environment. It's a smaller mirror of the production environment and a bunch of repository servers. I take a few pictures of the scribbles and send them to Stephanie, who promises to make them into a coherent documentation for the next assessment. I have what I need for now for a half-butt report. There may be follow-up questions, but I'm tired of being here. I thank everyone for their time. Clara jets out of the room while Raymond tries a soliloquy about how useful and productive this session was, and that our hard efforts made real improvements to Big Corp's metrics. I flash him a wan smile and gather my stuff. Clyde walks me out. Clyde turns to me and gives me a thin smile. I've never seen someone just stick with a question like that with those two. I laugh and bid him a good day. As I walk to my bike, I pull out my phone. Huh, I have about five missed calls and a few texts from a number I don't recognize. Oh boy, Mark, the interface guy from HQ. I wonder what he wants. I call him and hold the phone between my shoulder and ear while I pack the saddlebags of my motorcycle. Hello, Big Corp Help Desk. Hey, you were trying to get a hold of me for some reason? Yes, are you not coming into the office? Uh, no, wait, no, why does that matter? We don't support work from home on the help desk. Well, that's a shame. Must make it a bit harder to recruit. Anyway, I have the access I need. What do you need from me? You've not done any work on those tickets you've been assigned. What? Why are you assigning me help desk tickets? Why wouldn't you take help desk tickets? You're on the help desk. I'm a contractor working in cybersecurity. Why were you at the help desk? All the good cubicles were taken? Ask Squirrel. Anyhow, stop giving me tickets and reassign the ones you already sent me. Mark agrees and hangs up. Like most people, I'm happy to leave Pittsburgh. To be continued. Back on the help desk part 5, Knoxville. Knoxville, I thought I was clever. I've given myself an entire day tomorrow to make my way from Pittsburgh to Knoxville, where I'm going to review the security of a call center for Grey Goose users. Call centers are pretty easy to review from a security perspective. Look at HR policies for background checks, walk the floors to see if the clean desk, clean screen policies are followed, and fiddle with the shred bin to look like I care about such things. Ask to see proof of a few things. Note how well controlled entrances are and call it a day. I'm anticipating more work in deciding which barbecue restaurants I'm going to visit than this review. That was before I got emailed by Barry, the site manager. Barry had questions to almost every part of this review. My page-long agenda and document request with color-coded areas of interest lacked specificity and that he wanted me to pre-write any questions for the staff at his call center. Also, he explained that any documentation would not be made available, despite a pile of NDAs threatening the sternest outcomes. A few back-to-back -back emails got exchanged while I was stretching my legs or getting fuel between the Pennsylvania border and Charleston. It seems that my tires were working like a crappy prayer wheel, collecting CC'd managers in Big Corp in this email chain. I decided to stop at a small town public library and call Barry to resolve this. Miracle of miracles, 
I got him on the second ring. Barry, site manager here. Hi, this is Law Techie. We've been emailing back and forth, and I wanted to see if I can better explain what I'm doing to ease your concerns. I don't have concerns. I'm afraid that you're ambushing us with this vague and unclear audit. If you can't be more clear with the request, I'll have to cancel it. This is a repeat of last year's assessment. Same agenda, just making sure nothing material has changed to your risk. We didn't have an audit last year. It's uncalled for you to demand one with so little notice. Now, that's interesting. You agreed to it. I'm not going to ask you anything you need to prepare for. By the way, can I see the documentation I asked for? You can see whatever you want when you're here. I'm reserving the right to stop the audit if I feel you're playing games. Call me when you get to the building and I'll have security let you in. Sounds good. I'll see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Barry hangs up without fanfare. I think I'm going to regret the early start. I enjoy the winding West Virginia and Kentucky roads, finally making it to a mid-range hotel not too far from food, drink, and the call center. I avail myself of the food and drink a little too much and pass out in my hotel room. My alarm wakes me up and I regret the early start. In-room coffee, leftover barbecue, followed with a shower to clean off the barbecue, and remove wrinkles from my dress shirt, and I'm at least presentable and coherent, if not happy to be earning IHG points. A quick negotiation with the desk clerk lets me check my duffel bag and riding suit so I can ride a bit more lightweight to the call center. I'm at the call center at 7.58. There's no guard at the gate and Barry's not answering his phone. The call center is fenced on three sides, with the back running up to a gentle hill. The adjoining properties are other industrial office park buildings without fences. I decide to go exploring. At the end of one fence, a well-worn footpath connects the two properties. It's easily passable to pedestrians, and now, at least one motorcyclist. I park my motorcycle next to a small loading dock at the side of the call center. I try Barry again, only to hear the standard Avea voicemail prompt. I hop up on the loading dock and note a door wedged open. That door leads to a storage room with industrial shelving. I make my way into more office-like areas and press my phone to my ear to make it look like I know what I'm doing. Eventually, I find myself in a field of half-filled cubicles with the buzz of clicking keyboards and hundreds of customer service-related conversations filling the air. Thankfully, someone has put fake street signs at the corridor intersections for navigation. I stop to take a selfie outside an unoccupied cube with a gay street sign on the outside, then figure out where the conference room is. The conference room is unoccupied. I set up my laptop, notepad, then write, I'll be back in five getting coffee on a handy whiteboard. Somehow, this is more difficult than my other tasks this morning. Barry or Big Corp has selected a painfully complicated K-cup knockoff dispenser that uses something resembling a soy sauce packet and a miniature cock cylinder. Eventually, I figure it out and come back to the conference room with a one big team branded coffee mug full of caffeinated liquid. Two people are parked in the conference room, a man and a woman. I introduce myself and we engage in some pleasantries, as is expected this far from the Northeast. So far, we have Sandra, the operations director. She's in charge of IT, phones, and the reactor application, which seems to be more than just the back end to customer service. She's grandmotherly, but carries the vibe that she has dug some man-sized holes in the woods when things went bad. Johnny, the jocular recruiting and HR head, he's a storyteller. If I weren't hungover, I think I'd invite him out to swap some tails over a pitcher of beer. No Barry. Since I don't have specifics on the call center operations other than how other companies do them, I'm going to ask about how things are going, upgrades, changes, or problems. I don't realize that this sounds just like the ambush Barry was accusing me of. Sandra, Johnny, and I have polite conversations about operations, new business applications, and we're starting to get into any incidents they've had. Sandra starts talking about outages with both their incoming phones and the reactor application caused by networking difficulties. I'd like to learn more and I'm about to have her expand when my phone rings. I think it's Barry. To be polite, I inform Sandra and Johnny that I'm going to put him on speaker. Law Techie, are you late? 
No. I called and left you a few voicemails, then let myself in. That's rude. I've been waiting for you out front. Johnny pipes up. Barry, we're in conference room B. Barry is trying to do a few noisy things while mumbling incoherently. I apologize to him and hang up. Sandra, while we wait for Barry, can you give me a bit more detail on the networking issues? A few minutes of back and forth gives me the lay of the land. Staffing the call center is harder than it looks. Seems that slow hiring processes are a front end bottleneck, and the dynamic fast paced sales driven environment with low wages makes retention hard. Johnny thinks this is because people just don't want to work anymore. Johnny definitely wants to give his answer to your question. The above about the staffing problems was a basic question about their background check vendor. Voice over IP services and internal network support are handled by two different vendors who don't really coordinate technical change as well. Sandra would like to make them work better together, but she doesn't have management buy-in to threaten them. I ask more details about outages since she brought it up. For example, last week, the VOIP vendor wasn't able to route traffic to our backend. We couldn't initiate outgoing calls for a few hours. Barry enters the room with some force. He's out of breath. He stands there, staring at us with clear discomfort. He puts his hand on the table to steady himself, then slides into a chair like a collapsing building. We're all silent for a minute. Then it gets awkward. I start the conversation with Sandra back up again. So why did routing break? Our network vendor did a replacement of one of our two routers. When the new router came back up, the phones went down for three hours. That sounds like the failover fell over. Couldn't they just disconnect the new router until business hours? A rumbling noise comes from Barry, now leaning forward. The AI that controls the routers decided to tell the firewalls to block the traffic. This sentence throws me. If Barry had decided to speak in tongues at this moment, I'd just get syllables. If he had a stroke, the words wouldn't make sense. But these words sort of make sense. They are parse, but they sound incoherent. They're wrong in the way that makes me question what I know. Maybe Palo Alto is selling fully self-aware AI firewalls, and I haven't been paying attention. I ponder Barry's words while I hear my imposter syndrome warm up. You know when some application like Chrome or Slack decides to max out CPU and your fans kick on? This is what's happening. The app is trying to parse content while it worries that it's 10,000 bad decisions wrapped around a core designed by amateurs. I don't know how long I just sit there thinking about Barry's explanation. Ah, okay. Who controls this AI? Our networking vendor. I want to meet these people. If they sold Barry the Skynet support package, I'm not even going to rat them out. I just want to find out what the Kentucky equivalent for chutzpah is. I've learned all I'm going to from Sandra. I let her know I'll have follow-up questions and get her and the vendor's contact info before letting her go back to her day. I switch to Johnny about some dull HR things like training, write-up policies, and the like. He meanders, occasionally telling a story. I take notes, thinking I can figure out the answers for my checklist later. I think I've answered these questions. Occasionally, Barry says something. Nothing's been as crazy as the AI thing. He does like to hear his own voice. I decide I have what I needed from Johnny as well. I do need to review some policy and training documents, which unfortunately are hard copies in Barry's office. Barry hands me a few three ring binders and talks at me while I leaf through them, looking for the dull stuff like non-disclosure and acceptable use clauses, security training, and background checks. Do you think you're going to stab me in the back? No, Barry, I'm not here to stab you. Isn't there something else you need to be doing? You're just trying to make me look bad with your breaking into our office. No, Barry, you're doing fine on your own. But I don't say that. Barry, I didn't break in. I parked in the parking lot and walked in. The more you complain about it, the more I need to discuss it in my report. The faster I complete this, the faster I'm out of your hair. Barry harumps over to his desk and starts looking at his PC monitor. He might be working, he might not. 15 tense minutes later, I can say that I've looked over the same training materials and policies I've seen 10 times over. I look at my phone and see that Sandra has been so kind as to forward me their networking vendor's name and phone. I have what I need for this trip, and I'd like to be gone. Barry, I'd like to thank you for your time. 
Someone in vendor management will be in touch in a few weeks for any follow-up. Barry walks me out grumpily. I walk to my bike and decide to call the networking vendor contact. I get their voicemail. I leave a short message, then put my helmet and gloves on. With Barry watching, I ride back out the way I came, over the hill. I try throwing a rooster tail of dirt, but don't manage it. I ride back to the hotel, retrieve all my luggage and gear. I bungee my duffel bag to the bike, change into the riding suit in the parking lot. Then, my phone rings. It's Neil from the networking vendor. Hi there, is this Law Techie? It is. I wanted to ask about an outage you all had at Big Corp. Sure, sure. Sandra told me you'd be asking. Got a minute for a story? Sure. Neil tells me about a router changeout. He goes into enough details that I decide it's easier to walk into the hotel and get a notepad and pen than to dig out my notebook in my nicely bungee duffel bag. Nobody in the hotel seems to mind my return in a highlighter yellow suit. Neil's story boils down to the switch out was scheduled at 6 a.m. to avoid downtime. They powered down the old router a few minutes after starting. They validated that the failover worked successfully and that there was no interruption to the phone center, both for incoming and outgoing calls. They had the new router in the rack and lit by 6.30 or so. It routed traffic and everything was fine. They were out a little after 7 a.m. They didn't get called about the phone outage until two hours later. The VoIP vendor had changed the IP addresses for some of their infrastructure, which wasn't communicated to Neil's team until the outage. They were able to fix it once they found the misrouted ticket. Somehow, everybody conflated the router cutover with the outage. Neil decided it was a better look to apologize than explain. Thanks, can I ask one question? Did you tell Barry that you had AI? Does Barry seem to be an intelligent man? I don't want to say anything mean, but go on. I tried explaining load balancing and firewall rules as simply as possible to him. Somehow he decided that algorithm was the same as AI. I didn't want my lunch to get cold, so I said yes. Neil and I have a laugh for a minute, then hang up. I start my bike and prepare to get on the road. My phone buzzes. Like an idiot, I check to see its cause. I see it's an email from Barry. He wants to get the first draft of my report. I turn off my phone and ride south. While I'm annoyed by the day, I'm looking forward to the ride to North Carolina. I'm getting to ride for work and bill my employer mileage. I win. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Dominios. It says, some people are their own barriers to success. I'm telling you, that one got an angry upvote from me. This was a long story, obviously filled with a lot of incompetent people trying to run a massive company. But the one thing that keeps on going back over in my head is the fact that LaTeX was able to walk into a call center without any kind of security, go around a fence, in a back door, walk through the offices, right through the production floor, and into the conference room. And when he mentions it to them, they don't seem all that concerned about it. Wow. LaTeX has so many wonderful stories on their profile from nine years of posting to Reddit. Check it out if you haven't already. The link is in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.